There's nothing more we can do tonight. We'll check things out again. Do you hear that? There's like a little bit of an accent in his voice too. Oh, I was out for a walk and then... I feel like this was probably the first episode produced because this is episode four and he didn't do this in any of the previous ones. What's up guys, Kuro the Artist here, and welcome back to another Ben 10 Breakdown. Today, we're gonna be taking a look back at some of the first few episodes of Ben 10 Classic, and see if there's anything worth coming back to in Ben 10's earliest run of the show. These are the episodes I feel a lot of people have seen in general, not just fans of the show, but probably haven't in quite some time, maybe even years. So it'll be fun to break them down and see what they're like today. Real quick, I just want to run through some quick updates on my review style. First, since the classic series takes place in a road trip across the United States, I want to see if the route they take is actually mappable. So at the end of each batch of reviews, we're going to come back to this map and fill it in piece by piece. Previously, when I reviewed the pilot episode, which you can click the link in the description to see if you're interested, we know that the gang starts at Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. Stick around towards the end of the video, and we'll continue from there. I'm also going to have a little counter in the corner of the screen for every single time Ben says his signature catchphrase, it's hero time. Just as a little something extra to look out for when doing these reviews. Lastly, if any of you guys have any things you want me to look out for, stuff that I can keep track of or start making a new list of, similar to the map or the counter, please leave a comment. The first episode we're going to take a look at today is called Washington, B.C. This episode aired January 13th, 2006 on a Monday. This episode was written by Greg Klein, whose name you'll see popping up a few times in the written by credits of the classic series, and Tom Pugsley, who also wrote the pilot episode. Tom will be popping up a lot in the written by credits as well. This episode begins with the gang's second recorded stop in their road trip in Washington, D.C., where they come across Dr. Animo, a strange scientist who since being denied a special reward, starts to experiment on animals and build an army strong enough to take this reward by force. Meanwhile, Ben is on a quest to collect a golden sumo slammer card, and must learn that being a hero doesn't always come with its own reward. Let's take a look. Whoa, hold- alright, I know I just paused at the beginning last time, but I swear to god, is that- is that a stock sound effect? See, look, I found it right here on YouTube. See? I think it was really smart to use Heat Blast again as the first alien in this episode to kind of relate it to the last one, since this is like only the second episode and it uh, creates a sense of familiarity with the audience. That's a weird sound for Heat Blast's fire. Oh man, but Heat Blast is so cool though. Where'd you get it? I've been searching all over for that. These moments are very important too to let you know like it really is Ben. And of course, because ratings and censorship laws were pretty strict back then, this cop has some sort of crazy laser gun, which I think is actually like cooler, but it's like, it sucks to know like it's because they can't have real guns and that's that just makes this seem a bit ridiculous. Now, I really liked this scene because a lot of people kind of forget that Animo was just some dude. Like they, he, he gets very flanderized in the later seasons, even the later series, uh, where he's like this crazy evil genius who somehow has infinite funds to afford these giant mechanical contraptions with ants and like he always has a secret lab somewhere whereas here he's just like some crazy guy like in an apartment like obsessed with all these animals i really liked uh, when animo was much more grounded but then again i did have him build a machine that turns a person into a god in five years later so who am i to say anything right here the cheek overlaps the nose and see like how all this stuff it kind of looks like it was built in his house this kind of stuff is, I feel, what made Animo special. But, like, look at those nails, dude. Ugh. Get some clippers. How do you type? You'll find them under one roof at the grand opening of the district. That's clearly Paul Eiding. Only canned octopus. I thought this store prided itself on wide selection. Well, it's because you're in the can aisle, dude. Go to the seafood aisle. The seat splatters. That was an interesting sound, how it kind of, like, built up. You don't really hear that. <laughs> He really did all of this just to, like, take some stuff from the store? Well, I guess he doesn't have enough money for rent, but... This is a bit extreme, dude. Giant frog and put your hands up! That's also Paul Eiding. Grab and dash and electronics! Wait, no, is that D now? Frog and put your hands- Yeah, that's Paul, definitely. Dash and electronics! Now he's D Bradley Baker. You heard it here, folks. Oh, that thing always makes me think of, uh... That online Flash game. Something Pursuit. Savage Pursuit. And the Backstripe right here. 
That one's a pretty famous error, though. A lot of people know about that. That's a fast scooter, too. Where do I get one of those? And right here, his hair is black. And you can tell it's really black, and it's not just dark shading, because now it's brown. If there's anything I can do to repay you, anything you want. Jimmy. Alright, I, I feel like he, he should at least get it there. Now the lesson's starting to become a little warped, like you're not allowed to take anything from people. And I get like, you know, Ben's supposed to learn that he being a hero is important first and foremost, and it's not about the rewards or anything. So maybe Grandpa's trying to nail that lesson home, but I mean, come on. Like, he straight up said he would give him the card, just let him have the card. I was finally gonna score the gold sumo slammer card! No time for that now, Ben. There's absolutely enough time, it's just, it takes two seconds. He takes the card, he hands it to Ben, you go. It's like, what, 30 extra seconds? Come on. Come on, Max. It's about you knowing you did something good. Being a hero is its own reward. You're absolutely right, Grandpa, and I do agree that Ben needs to learn this lesson, but perhaps you could have taken the card and then hold on to it and then give it to Ben when you feel like he's deserved it. But, I mean, you didn't need to completely turn him away from the card there. Like, I've, I don't know. This, all of this, this is probably Animo's best episode, just because it really, like, gives him an identity. And that is an interesting thing to create a character that sort of parallels with what's happening with Ben here. How both Ben and Animo have something that they desire, and they aren't getting it, and now it's up to them to decide what kind of person they're gonna be and how they're gonna take that going forward. Washington, D.C. Or Washington, B.C. <gasps> She said it. I mean, this is revolutionary. Like, Animo doesn't have to be evil. He should just, like, I don't know, sell this to the government or something. He'd be rich. He'd get all of the accolades and admiration he desired if he just did this kind of stuff, but not in a crazy way. And he didn't win that award? Like, somebody beat him? What are the other guys doing? And now the debut of one of the most iconic aliens in the franchise. I wasn't too big of a, a fan of forearms growing up, I'm not gonna lie. Oh, they do they do just kind of appear on top. I always felt like they ripped out of his shirt, but they just kind of pop right on there. Oh, and look at that. There's some parts that aren't even connected to anything. This is a very disgusting, but such a visually captivating transformation sequence. Look at this. Oh my god, that face. Forearms kind of roars and growls a lot more than he normally does uh almost like he he was supposed to be much more animalistic with his vocal tones like listen to him right here you hear that how there's kind of like a roar put in right behind his voice and then listen to here when he says let's wrestle let's wrestle like his voice definitely gets much higher and much less animalistic uh in the series <laughs> Wow, she's gonna have great strength to do that kind of stuff. That and smacking the droid in the earlier episode, too. See, even, even Max is like, where's all this power coming from? Man, the animation in these episodes. I'm just, I'm always amazed by the classic series. And I like how, like, he's not even... Ooh, the inside of the mouth is actually kind of whack, now that I'm looking at it. But, you know, you can see his ribs and his muscles. And this scene right here is great. Like, where you see the shadows but he's also slightly moving too. So this isn't even a loop. Every single frame in this sequence is unique. Like you can see it's wrapping around him, but he's also slowly raising his head. First things first, we have to find- Look at the road, Max. Here it is, the first one of the series. Y'all ready? It's hero time. Boom. Ugh, ugh, I gotta see that. His hand is like shaking too. Like this is like a really intense thing that's happening to him. That's probably the best way I've seen the dial merge into his arm. And then the, the flick, the strong whoosh. Oh, brilliant. Now this I like too. You see the wings actually pierce out of his clothes. This is, this is probably the most well done transformation sequence. I've seen so far. Next to Heat Blasts. Heat Blasts is like a work of art, but Stink Flies is like, it really looks like he's transforming. God, Max is horrified. Butterfly! Also one of the first, I think the first named alien on screen. <gasps> Ooh, he almost, he almost dropped her. Stop Animo, we're all right. Nice, he also trusts Ben is like ready to fight too. He's like, go handle it, Ben, you got this. You got that Tennyson blood in you. Help me! Ah! Again, he, he definitely has enough time to do both. That's freaky as hell. How did they, how can they do this, but they can't have guns in the show? Look at that. You can even see it gets super stringy. Like this guy is, his body is literally burning away. 
I don't think the teeth are supposed to be black here, though. Jeez. Look, yeah, like up the neck. Look at all of this. Oh my god. <laughs> but this one is just... Whoop. <laughs> at least I snagged a trophy from Anima. I like that he starts collecting souvenirs and it comes up throughout the first season. I wish he kept doing that forever, now that I think about it. Like, by Omniverse, he can have, like, a whole wall or even a whole room dedicated to trophies and stuff. Okay, so second episode, not bad. The plot, I'm gonna give it a three. It does a good job of building off of the first episode, weaves a narrative that gives Ben the lesson that he needs to learn, and the parallel between Animo and Ben's desire for the Sumo Slammer card is nice. I feel like it could have been done a little bit better, but not in a way that I would really change anything. Like, it's, like it's, re it's really fine. Characterization, I'm gonna give a four. I feel like everyone was written much better in this episode than they were in the last one. Everything just felt that much more fleshed out. And I very much prefer how Animo is in this episode than the later ones. Visuals, I'm gonna give another four to. Again, you can never beat the classic series when it comes to their styles and animation. But it was really only in like small segments and stuff. Like when it mattered, it looked really good. But in this episode, not too much really happened. It was kind of just to further flesh out the characters. So there wasn't really too much of an opportunity for it to get like a five but what we saw everything we saw i'd say it looked really good importance it's gonna go down to a two you don't really need this introductory episode to understand the characters or animo especially because this is the only episode he's even treated like a character and while it's nice how it builds off of the first episode, this is one that you can really skip if you'd like to. And for entertaining, I'm just gonna give it a three. It did keep me engaged the whole time, but I'd say this episode is on the lower end of the rewatchability scale. We did get our first hero time though, and that was nice. That brings this episode to a total of 16 points. While I do feel like this episode is a little bit more fine-tuned than the last episode, it is held back by not really having a staple on Ben 10 as a whole, and it's not the most interesting episode out there. Moving on to the third episode of the series is The Kraken. First premiering January 14th, the following day of the last premiere, on a Tuesday. This one was written by Man of Action, the four founders of the Holy Grounds of Ben 10. The trio are taking a stop by a lake when they start to hear rumors of a mysterious creature living in the waters and Ben thinks he's seen it himself. Investigating this rumor is local sea hunter Captain Shaw and marine biologist Jonah Menville, who is secretly a trafficking criminal that is trying to steal the Kraken's eggs and sell them to the highest bidder. Come on, dive. This is really nice, this mist effect going across. Knock it off, midget! Ooh, that was harsh. How dumb can you be? Yeah, his voice is, it's still not quite there yet, forearms, but, uh. It sounded more like him than the last episode. Da -da 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 by a giant lake monster. All right, now his voice is starting to bug me. That's interesting. The wiki credits the whole Man of Action crew to writing this episode, but here it just says Joe Kelly and Steven T. Siegel. Although it does kind of stand to reason that if two out of the four Man of Action crew are writing an episode, maybe all of them had their input on it. I am going to give the full credit to Man of Action, but uh, if not, just let me know if anyone ever finds out. Ben doesn't have his little tuff of hair back here. He always looks weird when people forget to draw that. It, like, it really makes a difference. It balances out his face. Get a bard. I ain't got all day. Who is that? Jim Ward. Interesting. Jim Ward also does Accelerate, Diamond Head, and Wild Vine. Ben's hair is cut off right here. They probably drew him much lower and needed to raise him to be in line with the boat. Highlights aren't colored in his eyes. If you got the stomach for some real adventure. He says it to the kid so that he can convince the grandparent. The sky, man. Ben, I don't want you to put too much stock into what Mr. Shaw says. See, it's interesting because we find out later that Max has worked with the Saturdays on cryptid related matters. So it makes me wonder if this is part of Max still trying to keep the existence of like, you know, all aliens and supernatural stuff a secret. I mean, obviously it's because the decision to make Ben 10 and the secret Saturdays share the universe hasn't been decided yet. But you know, might as well make an effort to justify continuity. <laughs> And this is the first time Ben has ever mistransformed in the show. It took three episodes, but I like that they took their time to start introducing all of the abilities and disadvantages of the Omnitrix. The show doesn't shove it all down your face at once. So you have enough time to accept what happened in the last episode so that they can keep on building in the next. Hey, I said rip jaws, not accelerate, stupid watch. 
Ben also mentioning uh, aliens he hasn't transformed into on screen has also implied that he has used the Omnitrix and had adventures in between episodes. It's not that big of a detail, but it's something to note that every time you see Ben on screen, that's not everything he's done. There are important things happening off screen. I like that he trips a little bit too. Accelerate always had the best sound effects, I swear. How fast do you need to be to run on water? Wow, would you believe 67 miles an hour? I mean, I guess it's never been proven before, but you'd think it needs to be at least a little bit faster. That was pretty slick. So he stops spinning enough for him to, like, have a stance and then backflips onto the boat. Nice job, Accelerate. That is, this guy is fast. Helmet looks pretty whack here, though. Oh, wow, and Accelerate looks freaking jacked here. Man, this is a great episode for Accelerate. <laughs> Man overboard! Bring the boat around! This is just like the last episode with a card. Like, Shaw, if he really wanted to, has enough time to shoot that harpoon and get Ben. These people act like you can only do one thing or the other. Like, there's multitasking. In fact, Max could throw the life preserver. Not that I want the Kraken to get shot, mind you. Like, I'm pro Kraken. But I mean, there's better ways to have conflict. Ooh. He almost killed that kid. It's hero time. That's another. Oh my god. The luck. Ooh, look at look at that. That's 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 not right. Looks like we were both a little too hard headed. I'm glad that Max owned up to that too. Good for you, Max. He's like, I was wrong. Let's go save the day. Find the eggs. What about Oh that must have been hard to animate. Like Ben right here, the boat's going up and down and they have to like match Ben to the boat. They didn't have to do that. Oh, they don't do it here. Which is strange, because it'd be so much easier here. Just shift the image up and down. From the perspective they were at before, you'd have to redraw it. New transformation. This part always looked disgusting to me. It's like throbbing. And these little flashes uh, where it turns inverted are always nice too. The classic series does that a lot. And he's wearing his life preserver too. I like that they changed uh, the transformation for this. This one's very well done too, especially this shot right here. That's great. The transformation background plate seems pretty clean here, too. He's got some great tech for being a criminal. Oh, man. Oh, man. Those are sturdy, lucky eggs. Look at Gwen's little... Whoop, 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 whoop. Yeah, watch this. Gwen totally understands all of this. What? It doesn't even matter, either. This guy just jumps him. Boom. <laughs> she turns around to make sure. Good. So this, this happens really quickly, but the transition into his swimming, uh, a, what would you call this, tail? Appendage, I guess? That's such a really cool thing for Rip Jaws to be able to do. That's such a big jaw, too. This is a pretty great action. Ah! Yeah, good. Be a hero, Ben. Yeah, but don't forget who's the bad guy. Not my favorite episode, to be honest. The plot only gets a two for me. It is simple and bare bones like the previous episodes, but unlike the previous episodes, it didn't even seem to have its own flair on the genre. It's just the usual, there's a ship where there might be a monster in the sea and then they find out there really is, but they lie about it to protect it. It's nothing new and not the best thing for Ben 10, but I wouldn't say there's any real big plot holes in it either and nothing that really ruins the episode. It's just not special. Characterization, I'll give it a four. The characters were written very well for themselves. They had some clever lines. They seemed very much like themselves. So it at least has that going for it. Visuals, I'm gonna give it a three. The action was stellar. The scenes with Accelerate and Rip Jaws were extremely well done. Stinkfly scene was all right too. And the Kraken moved pretty nicely. But the very rundown, swampy, murky sort of feel of the episode is not that appealing to look at. It does fit the tone of the episode, but that doesn't excuse it for being boring to look at. Importance? I'm gonna have to roll roll out another two. It's a completely skippable episode. The only reason it has any points to begin with is because it is the first time you see Ben mistransform, although that isn't really important as it seems to have happened off screen enough times for Ben to recognize what has happened. So we as the audience never really get to see the first time Ben actually mistransformed. And like I said, the action scenes with Accelerate and Rip Jaws were really good. But other than that, this episode's alright if you want to go ahead and skip it. Entertaining, I'm gonna give it a three. It does seem like I would 
would probably give it a little bit lower points with all of my previous statements, but I wouldn't exactly say this episode bored me to tears. It is still Ben 10. It's nice to see the characters and it's cool to see the aliens. And the Kraken, despite its only appearance being in this episode, and somewhat of a reference to it in Omniverse, but we'll get there. It does seem to have a pretty significant impact on the fans as a very memorable episode. And it even had its own online game. It is still something I'm all right rewatching again. New outfit, sorry, I forgot to record the final bit. But that brings the Kraken up to a total of 14 out of 25. Not looking too good, but at least it's above the halfway margin. Hey guys, quick reminder, the first 10 chapters of Five Years Later is available to read for free on our website. And if you'd like to support the idea of turning this series into a fully voice acted and musically scored motion comic, how about giving the trailer a watch? The link is in the description. Now, let's get back to the breakdowns. Continuing Ben 10's odd premiere dates, on Saturday of that week, January 21st, Permanent Retirement premiered on Cartoon Network, written by Marsha F. Griffin. Marsha has only written two episodes of the series during the show's entire run, so let's see if she can get it right. This episode has Max bring the kids along to a visit to their Aunt Vera in Retirement Village. But Ben starts to notice something strange going on with the neighbors. It turns out that residents are starting to be replaced by the Limax, shape-shifting aliens that feed on old people specifically. Let's see how this plays out. What do you have that's non-fat with less than 3% sugar? Napkin. <laughs> that's a good line. I'm about to go Rocky Road. That was not a good line. This is a pretty cool introduction for Upgrade. He just did that last episode as Ripjaws, too. The excitement in this place is probably watching the grass <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Look at Gwen. Their idea of excitement in this place is probably Why? She's like sadly typing away. She's not even looking at the screen. She's like, it's Ben's time to say his line. I just have to sit here and deal with it. Did you see that? No, she was too busy gazing into the abyss. It's crazy that sometimes this show will put such incredible detail into things like Vilgax's groans, but Aunt Vera's watch can look like this. Uh, now, what are these brown chunks in the mold? That's that's a that's a strange line delivery. Can we have that again, Paul? Ghost Freak being inverted when he's intangible is such a great idea though. Loser. Oh Ben. You're such a goof. So it's interesting that the Omnitrix... Oh, wow, look at that dial. Uh, yeah, the Omnitrix turns intangible with Ghost Freak, but his eye doesn't. I would have both the eye and the Omnitrix not be intangible. I feel like if his eye can be beyond that effect, the Omnitrix definitely should. There's something fun to do around here. Yeah, let's go steal something. So there's a carpet. I wonder if this is supposed to be like an allusion to a dead body. Oh. Ah! That's a sweet effect. He doesn't turn his head around. It like merges forward. Look at that. And there's like some bounce when it forms into place too. Like there's actual motion happening. The body too. It's like selective parts of him turn around rather than the entire thing. Cause the arm that's putting it down is his left arm, but up here it's his right arm. So that's pretty cool. Man, whoever owns that is gonna be pissed. Oh no, my eczema. Ben, you snuck out. Aunt Vera was hurt. Ah, she's old. She'll forget. Okay. Oh. Oh my God. Well, maybe we should do some investigating. I really like that Max, like right off the bat, believes him. Us old fogies don't forget as much as you think. See, and he's kidding around too. God, Max is such a good guy. There's nothing more we can do tonight. All right, well, maybe his voice is his flaw, at least for this episode. Like, I love Paul Eiding as Grandpa Max, but I don't know, you can definitely tell this is one of the first few episodes. But once I'm back, we'll check things out again. Do you hear that? There's like a little bit of an accent in his voice too. It's not that important. Like, I definitely didn't notice this like the first 10 or so times I've seen this episode. But now that I'm trying to like analyze these episodes for these breakdowns, like it's sticking out to me hardcore. <laughs> All right, that's definitely not Aunt Vera. Come on. <laughs> no reaction? What? See, Ben gets it. He's like, did you see that, Gwen? Mm, yeah, that strange orange light is back. Got it. I'm starting to speak much. I wonder if that was like a plant for something that they didn't really follow through for. Like where Gwen would be able to understand Wild Mutt because he didn't even point to anything. Like he straight up just made noises at her and she was like, got it. So 
I know it wouldn't really make sense, but it would have been cool to like see some type of thing build off of that, like where Gwen can understand Wild Mutt. I don't know. It's not really needed. Oh, those things are strong. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, my God. Wild Mutt's teeth isn't colored in right here. There's a lot, there's a lot of like unfilled in corners. I've noticed this in a few scenes in earlier episodes, but I cut my reaction. But this one I'm keeping because it's so, it's very noticeable in this shot. Oh, I was out for a walk and then. All right. Yeah. You see that voice? Come on. I feel like this was probably the first episode produced because this is episode four and he didn't do this in any of the previous ones. Look what's that. Wow. How many old people live here? They've got Aunt Vera. And this is the first time we see the real ending that he blasts transformation. It's a very strong pose for him. I like it. Oh, uh, I think, I don't think that was supposed to happen because you hear a sound effect as if he's charging up something, but you don't see anything in his hands. But then he just shoots out this beam. Ooh, this, this frame looks really cool. That's a nice frame. But yeah, like, listen. It sounds like the, there was supposed to be something there in his hands. So what happens to their collective consciousness? Like, are the Limax all, like, one thing that's split up in the middle? Or when this thing fuses, do their minds combine? I mean, I guess it looks cool, but like, I don't know. None of this stuff matters, but this is what I think about when I watch stuff like this. Yeah, so maybe it, like, spawns... I don't know. I don't know what's going on. They hate water! I will! Aw, that's good. I'm glad he gave her a hug. And we get this, but they never actually return. Okay, so the plot can run itself back up to a three. As you can see, none of the first few episodes of Ben 10 are really all that complicated when it comes to the plot. But I feel like that's a good thing for the early episodes of the series. This is another one that's pretty tropey, but I like what I saw. I wouldn't have mind if the Limax actually did return one day. Characterization, it's gonna get another three. Despite being written by a guest writer, none of the characters really seemed that much out of character, but there wasn't too many characters to deal with, especially because Max got replaced halfway through the episode, and a lot of the focus was really put on Ben, who at this point is pretty hard to get wrong. Aunt Vera seemed a little bit too nonchalant, and of course, there was that questionable Grandpa Max voice. Visuals, this episode, I feel like deserves a five. First five, I've given since the pilot. All of the action was really well done. The Limax, while not too complicated of a design, looked very brilliant in animation. There's a lot of little things in this episode where they really went the extra mile with the way they had the animators incorporated movement. And with an episode like this, where there's a lot of liquidy and shape-shifting characters, it's very easy to want to cheapen the effects as something with this much fluidity, especially because you can always see the inside of the Limax's organs and whatnot changing and breathing. It's very easy to not want to have to put in all the effort to make it look good but you can tell the animators didn't slack in this episode importance unfortunately that's where this episode comes down i'm gonna have to give it a one aunt vera while she does return in omniverse her return is not needed with this episode as her introduction the limax never return there's nothing that has to do with the overall arc and since the only real character that this episode focuses on is ben and he doesn't really develop much in this episode either you're really not missing much much. It's a great episode to watch for its fun visuals, but it's a totally skippable episode. But entertainment, that's where this episode's strength comes out again, and I'm gonna have to give it a four. I just really like how this episode looks, and despite having a simple plot, being able to sort of see where this episode is gonna go and points out its tropes almost makes it that much more engaging. When you see the subtle hints that the Limax is one weakness is water, you want the main characters to figure it out and use it to their advantage. And overall, it's just a very fun episode. That brings Brings permanent retirement up to a 16 out of 25, better than the last episode, but it still can't beat the pilot. Let's move on to the next one. Our final review of the day will be the fifth episode, Hunted. This premiered the following Saturday on January 28th, 2006, written by Adam Beacon, who has also only written a handful of episodes during Ben 10's entire 230 episode catalog. Many fans find this episode to be the first turning point in Ben 10's story, as we finally return to the Vilgax plotline first established in the pilot episode. Vilgax hires three intergalactic bounty hunters to go down to Earth and retrieve the Omnitrix from Ben Tennyson. But unknown to Vilgax, and for most of the episode, the main trio themselves, 
One of them is secretly on their side and is trying to protect Ben and the Omnitrix. Meanwhile, now that Ben has been used to the hero game for a few adventures, he realizes he has to start expanding how he uses the Omnitrix and think a little bit more tactically. Here's that boy. So you think that's because of his armor. But we know. We know. You are all hired. That's smart too. Vilgax is like, you know what? You're all in it. Why choose? This is this is a great scene too. When you see Ben practicing, this is freaking elaborate. Like he built all of this just to use like once. Cause you can only use it once too. They're on the road. I suppose they don't have to keep on traveling, but they know they're going to, so. <laughs> So I was wrong about the last transformations. Uh, I'm pretty sure in later transformation scenes, you see the spikes grow out of his back. I'm pretty sure later on they like, they edit the transformation a little bit. They actually redid the whole thing here. See, look, there's this extra motion where he sort of shoves his arm forward. Now the crystals are like forming out of his knuckles too and overlapping his fingers. His skin is also, there's like this pale wrapping around it. Like there's this type of protection happening before he gets absorbed in diamonds. And I'm very indifferent about the new eye scene. Cause here you see the pupil kind of flip up, which is nice. And then this effect is very nice. But I also liked how last time you saw the detail of the crystals overlapping his eye. I guess, I guess it's cool that like we have two different versions so that we can compare and I don't have to choose, I guess. Why pick a favorite if you don't need to? That quick head turn. It's nice. And this part too, I love it. Uh, the crystals kind of jolt out. Let's see that in motion. Nice. And he's so shiny. He's good. You can't deny that. Look at this. Incredible. And I like it too because Ben's cocky and like that's the lesson of this episode. But it's not like other characters where they're like cocky because that's their personality. Like Ben's cocky because he's good. I've kicked so much alien butt my feet hurt. All right, yeah, you know, he he could tone it back a little bit. He's also 10. So like what 10 year old wouldn't want to brag if they had that much dexterity? But it's good that Max is like trying to keep Ben in line with becoming a good person. Like Max really shapes who Ben grows up to be. And you especially see the contrast of Ben without Max in the episode Ben 23, a universe where Ben grows up when Max dies early. But that's, that's hundreds of episodes away. Also, while I've been paused, I can see that they didn't line up Ben here with the table. Now, uh, this shot right here, I'm sure a lot of people recognize from that battle ready game, still never beat it. This shot right here was reused in that game as the starter cutscene. And now right here is where you get the Gwen 10 reskin of the game. This is the second time we've seen Ghost Freak and the second time Ben's used it to screw with Gwen. Now this sound effect right here, I feel is in every single episode of the classic series in some way, shape or form. Oh, that's a really neat looking attack. Look at that. It could just be a laser, but no, it, it looks like this. I always appreciate the extra effort this series put in. Although they always seem to be doing Ghost Freak's Omnitrix icon dirty. The Omnitrix is drawn pretty weirdly in this shot too. Remember me? That's the same move the giant robot did in the first episode to Ben. Oh my god. Max. No Ben. That's just what it wants. See, Ben should take Max seriously here, because Max usually has Ben's back. So when he says to stand down, I would stand down. I don't like how Crab reacts to the smoke here. His function is that his head pops into here to protect him. I feel like he should have did that. It's the most powerful weapon in the galaxy. The key to an epic battle between good and evil. Man, I love how they're hyping up the Omnitrix now. Like, we take for granted how much we know about it. But back when it was like this big mysterious thing that like every little bit of information about it was mind blowing. I miss the mystery of the show. I know too much. You're me. Wrong. I am a noble warrior. So I know that, you know, Diamond Head is voiced by Jim and Tetrax is voiced by Dave. But like back in the day, I could not tell the difference between their voices because like they do the same kind of voice. I, I kind of wish their voices were like if they were going to go through the effort of having two different voice actors, like make them sound a little bit more different, you know? They both kind of do this voice, you know? You see this little dust swirl thing? Everything just always looks so good. Yeah, that tracks. Look at him. 
go, god. Ben should be taking notes. Alright, hero time. Don't just try to muscle it. Might isn't always right. Do you ever pause to consider your actions at all? Can't wait for Ben to learn this lesson ten more times in future episodes. This may be of some use in the meantime. Are you serious? Ah, uh, if only he used it more. Came with his action figure, though. I wonder if Vilgax has grown a little bit more since the last episode. Oh, nah, he's about the same. And with that, we have the fifth and final episode of this video reviewed. Got ourselves another hero time, so that makes three for our counter. Time to give it a rating. Plot, I'm going to give it a four. This one is definitely a step up from all of the previous episodes. Like, this feels like we're finally starting to dive into the meat of the show. It doesn't really follow too much of a generic plot line, although it definitely does have its own tropes, but so do the other episodes. And it introduces and expands on a lot of the things that we come to know will be major important factors and characters in the Ben 10 series. And speaking of characters, these ones get a solid 5. I feel like the growth in this episode for Ben, from what we've seen so far, is the first time he's really starting to take the idea of using his powers in a way that's not just either playing jokes or beating up the bad guys. This is a Ben that now wants to learn and understand his transformations and all of their strengths and weaknesses. And it's nice to see the full support of Max behind him, and even Gwen starting to step up and take this alien stuff a lot more seriously rather than it just being something annoying she has to deal with over the summer from her perspective. Tetrax, of course, is a fan favorite character who's only had a selective amount of appearances in the franchise, but every time you see him in the classic series, he's such an interesting character. His story alone just shows how the Ben 10 universe is so much bigger than what's going on with the main trio. And aside from Vilgax, he's our first true introduction to what really is going on in outer space. Visuals, I'm gonna give it a 4. While the animation is as pleasing as ever, and the fight scenes were very good. Similar to the Kraken, a lot of what holds this episode back from having a higher score in the visuals is the setting. The whole episode just looks orange. And the fact that Ben used the same alien twice, and the same species of that alien, is also a main character in the episode. There's a lot less diversity with people we get to deal with. But as always with this series, the stuff we saw was brilliant. Importance, you have to give it a 5. Not only does this add so much to the Ben 10 lore, and introduce a lot of characters that do come back in future episodes, and entertaining, come on, you know it's gotta be a 5. I feel like everything I said during the reaction, and my reviews on the past four categories can be a testament on why this episode is just so damn entertaining. It's hard to watch this and not just get drawn into the universe of Ben 10. Maybe I'm just overhyping this episode. Maybe I'm just stuck in nostalgia. It's not alienating at all if you haven't seen the first four episodes, and in fact I would say this episode makes you want to watch the show even more than what the pilot could do. That brings this episode to a full 23 out of 25. I did not think I would get an episode that scores this high, not only in the first season, but within the first five episodes of the show alone. I guess that really goes to show how well this episode was written, how it was produced, and the care that was put into developing the lore without it just being so much exposition shoved in your face. Had I not known what's going to come in the future of this series, this episode just opens up your imagination to what could possibly come in the future, and I feel is definitely enough to get you hooked and make you a fan of the show. Now that we've gone through the episodes, we can start building our road trip timeline. We know that since the first episode, the gang traveled to Washington, D.C., so that's a landmark right there. And while that is quite a distance from their original starting point, it's safe to assume that they probably made some other stops along the way. This is where the map making gets a bit tricky, as not every episode gives us a definitive location. But we'll try to make sense of it anyways. The Kraken takes place somewhere warm and swampy, so we can assume that the gang probably started going south. And at one point, Captain Shaw says, Sightings go back hundreds of years on this very lake. And from this photograph, we're led to believe that it was the Kraken that inspired the tale of the Loch Ness Monster. But a quick Google search shows us that the Loch Ness Monster rumors originated all the way over in Scotland, and it's unknown when these rumors actually made their way over to America. But we can at least trust that after DC, we're heading south. Permanent retirement again doesn't give us a definitive location, but extremely hot weather is noted by many characters in the episode and is even a significant plot point. It's also stated by the Limax that they are currently in a desert, so this further backs the idea that they are indeed going down 
down the map. Hunted, while the episode itself doesn't give us a location, but we're actually saved by the pop-up trivia airings of this episode. And now we know that this episode takes place in New Mexico. Gwen also says, My Intellimat program says this is Slatterville. Doesn't seem to be a real place. But hey, an actual state is good enough for me. With all of this information in mind, our path should look a little something like this. Don't forget to subscribe to be notified of the next Ben 10 breakdown and see where else this map takes us. These episodes were certainly a treat to rewatch. They really surprised me with how well they held up. Not just due to airing over 15 years ago, but these are also early episodes of the series in general. When I was a kid and the show was well into its airings, I had the first three seasons on DVD, and these episodes were some of my least favorite to come back to. Because frankly put, the show just gets so much cooler than this, and I wanted to see all of the big alien battles and whatnot. But perhaps we overlook these episodes and don't give them a fair chance when we think about what makes a good Ben 10 episode. The first season of a series is typically the worst when it comes to animation, although there are some exceptions. But Ben 10 didn't seem to have too much early installment weirdness, if at all. These episodes, despite being much smaller scale, I still feel can stack up to the bigger and grandiose episodes that come in the future, that are much cooler and more popular among fans. And it really goes to show how well the core foundation of the show worked all the way since the beginning, and is a great example of what made the show so successful in its time. The animation, as you can tell from my countless things to say about it, is nothing to overlook, and it can be so fascinating and well done at times that you can't help but stare and admire what's happening on screen. The characters, while still not up to their full selves, are still entertaining enough to watch on screen, and the aliens definitely make use of every second of their screen time. The fact that the fifth episode of the whole series managed to score a 23 out of 25 on what I believe to be a very fair and efficient ranking system only makes me more excited to see how the future episodes stack up in this new analytical perspective I'm watching the episodes on and I hope you guys stick around to see yourselves as well. You can also stay updated with everything that we do over on our Discord, and join our Patreon for only $1 a month for exclusive updates weekly on our projects. But until next time, keep it fizzy.